This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. Hope you all enjoyed the most recent show where we took a little bit of a diversion and we, had, we actually covered the first ever novel on the Human Action Podcast, namely All Quiet on the Western Front, the great anti-war book by Eric Marie Remark, which was, uh, I think, fun. A lot of people responded favorably to that. And uh, this week, we're going to take a little bit of a detour as well. Normally, we cover uh, substantive economics or political theory or related topics on the show. But this week, we're going to discuss a book called Safe Haven by the great Mark Spitznagel. Now, many of you know probably Mark Spitznagel's name. He is the hedge fund guru and president of Universa Investments. That's how he makes his living. But also back in 2013, he wrote a book called The Tao of Capital, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit. And I thought there'd be nobody to better to bring on the show than our great friend, Dr. Robert Murphy. Uh, Bob is not only someone who's maybe on the mathier end of the economist you might be familiar with, but also Bob... Uh, somehow over the years, you have managed to become involved with Mark Spitznagel and that he reached out to you and asked you to help him sort of check some of the Bomberwerk and the Menger in the Dow of Capital for accuracy or correctness. And I guess you were also involved with his new book, Safe Haven, in some way. Right. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. And and yes, um, I don't remember how he found me or, you know, if it was a mutual friend that suggested it, but but yes, for his earlier, for Mark's earlier book on the Dow of Capital, he specifically wanted me just to give him some help with and double check the Bombaverkian capital theory stuff. And then, yeah, when he was now for his new book, Safe Haven, my specific role was to check. There were some things about Daniel Bernoulli and how economists deal with risky ventures that he brought me in for. And, and but I also, I, you know, I saw earlier drafts of the manuscript and, you know, gave some comments on that. Well, I believe you're both NYU grads. I know you received your econ PhD from NYU, and, and Mr. Spitznagel, I believe, received an advanced math degree from NYU where he met or worked with uh, Nassim Taleb, who is once again uh, involved in this book in writing a forward or an introduction. And a lot of you are familiar with Taleb and his work on randomness and black swans and this sort of thing. So, Bob, I want to refresh people's memory or introduce them anyway, just briefly before we get into Safe Haven. The Tao of Capital is really a very Austrian book, came out in 2013. It's actually subtitled Austrian Investing in a Distorted World. And it's, it's really all about capital. We might even say it's a book about time because roundaboutness, uh, that's a very Austrian concept. And that comes up throughout the book. And the Tao, uh, he sort of weaves into the story a little bit about this Chinese concept of the way or the trail or the path. So that's the Tao. In other words, viewing capital as a process, a temporal process rather than something which is just sitting there at any moment in time. And he really describes in the Tao of Capital his concept of tail hedging. Uh, we all know when you look at a, a graph, there's a sometimes a long tail on one end of it. And this is the idea of profiting uh, actually benefiting from malinvestment when bad uh, investments are being liquidated. So if the, if the Dow of Capital is a book about time, maybe Safe Haven is a book about risk. But uh, going back, Bob, I, it's pretty shocking how much Menger and Mises and Bomberwerk and, and Rothbard is in the Dow of Capital. I mean, people who don't know this book should really take a look at it, even if they're not necessarily interested in the hedge fund or investing world. Yeah, that's exactly right. And a lot of times people will contact me and say, hey, you know, I like Austrian economics, but is there any investment book out there for, you know, if I were an Austrian, what would I do? And so it's it's probably not exactly what they are think they want. But yeah, I will say, go at least check out, yeah, Mark Spitznagel's book, The Tao of Capital, Be, because I'm sure you've noticed this trend too, Jeff, that um, especially when QE was a, th was a big, you know, hot topic. A lot of people were throwing around Austrian economics in the investment newsletter type world who didn't really know that much about it. And they just knew though that, oh, yeah, a lot of the potential readers out there care about this school of thought, you know, the kind of people that don't like what the Fed's doing. They also like the Austrian school. And so they would throw out, you know, Mises or Hayek or whatever. But but Mark was the real deal. Like he really, you know, wanted me to to vet his stuff and to make it. It was, you know, solid in terms of some some stuff that's admittedly difficult. You know, Bombavik and capital theory is not. 
Um, just a matter of, oh, I don't like the government. Like it's, it's pretty complex stuff. And so that was pretty solid. And, and yes, what, what he ended up the sort of bird's eye view of what he was doing in that book was to take Austrian business cycle theory to realize what the federal reserve had been doing was putting the U S economy and the you know global economy in danger of a crash. And then what do you do? And so unlike his former, uh, partner and then still, you know, friend and colleague, uh, Taleb, the, the black swan author, Taleb was more just saying, Hey, you can't know the future that everything's uncertain and just be careful. Like don't realize the future's more open-ended than you realize sort of thing. And who knows when a crash is coming, but it's probably more likely than you realize. And so prepare yourself. Whereas Mark was more about, no, we can know when a crash is coming. We don't know the exact date and magnitude of course, but we can be armed with, for example, Austrian business cycle theory. And so they there are some differences in their viewpoint. I think Taleb is more nihilistic than Mark is. Um, and then, yeah, with the tail hedging, it was just in case people don't know what, what does that mean. So it, what would you do if you thought that, that the chance of a, a big recession or the stock market falling 20 percent, you weren't saying it was going to happen next year, but you thought the chance of it happening was was much higher than most people on Wall Street believed. So you would still be long the S and P index or something, so that if it, if it went up like you thought it would, then you would profit from it. But then you would also buy put options on the index for him. So if it falls a lot, then those options pay off handsomely, and so you're hedged. So if you're wrong and it doesn't crash, you lose some of the you know the cost of buying those options and keep rolling them over as they expire to keep them in you know in place there. So you don't make as much on the upside. But then when there is a if there is a crash then you know those things really kick out and you and you make a bunch whereas other people who are just long they of course just eat it if you know if the mar- if the index falls 30% then they're down 30% but you're hedged there cuz your put options pay off well bob one thing i find really intriguing about mark spitzenkel is he's sort of of two minds first of all he's very esoteric anyone who's read the dow of capital will know that uh and he's a philosophical guy he's a thoughtful guy clearly a well read guy and a brilliant guy uh, you know, I didn't always love every page of the Dow Capital, let's just say. But while on the one hand, he's very esoteric, he's also very much an applied technical uh, mathematic actor. I mean, this, this, you know, people come to us and they say, what can I do? What should I do? How do we apply Austrian economics? And he is definitely that. I mean, there's a niche out there for people who want applied economics, I guess we can call it. And, and both this book and then the new book, Safe Haven, I think, is even more so. This is mathier, wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, there's long sections of various chapters that just go through specific numerical examples. And, you know, he gives the caveat that, hey, you can skip this stuff if you want. But in some of the chapters, I think, like, you wouldn't get the point of the chapter unless you work through the math. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not that any given thing, you, you don't need to know calculus or anything like that. It's mostly just, like, knowing basic probability and things. But but it is, yeah, long chains of reasoning that involve arithmetic at several of the steps. And yeah, if, if you're not willing to work through it, then you're probably going to miss some of the point of what he's getting at, at least in some of the chapters. Well, Bob, my takeaway, though, is that there's a lot of applications to life and how one proceeds with one's life in this book, not just the investing world. But in other words, when we're talking about risk mitigation, and that's what this book is all about, safe haven investing, Um he he makes this really incredible point and this incredible claim that you know not only has to be cost effective, it actually has to add economic value to a portfolio over time. Because I'm sure, Bob, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty rudimentary investor. I buy and when I buy things, I buy like an index fund. Or something. I'm not a sophisticated financial person at all. So nonetheless, but I think normies, perhaps when it comes to investing, like you and me. Uh, we think of these things as costs, right? Like, well, I have to have life insurance, right, Bob? Mm-hmm. I have kids and I have to have life insurance and that costs me X per year. And I hope I don't die. But if I do, you know, at least my wife and kids will get this money. And so, but I don't think of my life insurance policy as adding economic value to my life. I think of it as a cost. Right. And this is something where it took me a bit to, to get what Mark was saying. And and so I'll, I'll tr- keep this brief, Jeff, but just so the listeners understand what Mark is sort of recoiling against. So in standard, I guess you'd call it mainstream financial economics, like the stuff that 
was sort of pioneered in the University of Chicago and then kind of spread and took over, you know, this this new field, as it were. Um, there's this ostensible trade off between risk and return. And so the, the, the way they would model standard investors utility functions is to say that, you know, for a given, you know, between two investments, you would prefer the one that has a higher expected rate of return. But you would also prefer the one that has a lower expected volatility. And so um, and then the, and they, they start from that basic assumption and then they go ahead and and go to town with that. And, and so you're right that you end up saying things in that framework that, you know, are true insofar as they go. But it, it fosters this mentality that, oh, if you're risk averse, if you want to, you know, be, avoid if you want to take on measures, you want to like get assets. Oh yeah, I'm long the stock market. So let me go get an asset that's uncorrelated with the stock market so that in case the market crashes, this other asset won't go down too, or even better yet, why don't I get something that's negatively correlated with the stock market and add that to my portfolio. So I'm, I'm better hedged, but normally the, the, the price of doing that is that it's like you say, Jeff, you're going to, you're going to suffer a lower expected return because of that. And so the the it fosters this mentality that you can either swing for the fences or you can play it safe, but then you probably won't have a lot of runs scored. If I want to switch to a baseball metaphor, and th- and that's exactly what he's railing against in this. He's saying that no, properly conceived, what you're trying to do is to maximize how much wealth you have. You know, at the end of your third, let's say you have a thirty year time horizon. What can I do with my portfolio to maximize how much wealth I think I will have after thirty years? And he's saying it's wrong to think of insurance as playing it safe, but then that lowers my long run expected return, which is you know the normal conventional framework, because the whole point, or, or if that is true, then why do I want to have it? You know what I mean? If, if the point is I want to have as much wealth after 30 years as possible, then why would I put in this investment into my portfolio that admittedly is, is a drag on the long-term growth prospects? So, th- so that's where he's coming from. And and believe me, I, I imagine some listeners, especially those who are familiar with the conventional framework, are upset and saying, what are you talking about? That's a he's making an elementary mistake. It's the difference between the expected return and the, and the risk. But he's aware of that. And it's his position is a lot more nuanced. You know, and again, in the beginning, when I first read his draft, I gave him comments and said, no, no, you're misunderstand. And then just going back and forth and reading other sections of his book, I, it dawned on me what he was getting at. He really is saying something important that does challenge the conventional framework. And he's not just saying it, he's doing it. I mean, right, he runs, yeah. he runs mm-hmm. Universa Investments, and he, which I believe has like a $5 million minimum buy-in. And he has real clients, and he has real scoreboard. And every once in a while, every couple of years, it seems like the Wall Street Journal writes up a little article about his scoreboard successes. And of course, when COVID hit uh, last spring, I recall reading just that in the Wall Street Journal, some crazy article about how his fund had returned 4,000% in a month or something because this was sort of, I I don't want to say a black swan event because that's overused, but the kind of uh, tail event which Spitznagel designs his fund to benefit from. So, uh, you know, he opens this book with a section called At War With Luck. And I, it struck me, I mean, he goes through some basic principles. And I think even if you're not financially savvy, if you're just sort of interested in Austrian economics, but of course, you do have some investments or something like that. I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefit uh, to reading that. But Bob, I guess one takeaway is that all investing, in a sense, is risk mitigation, right? I mean, you're never investing money to lose it. Right. And I think that's part of what he's getting at when he's challenging this conventional paradigm Again, that was fostered by mathematical economics and applied in a, in a financial analysis. That that right, it's 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 wrong to think of it as as um, like oh, on the one hand, you've got your desire to go ahead and maximize returns, but then the thing that's competing with that is your desire to minimize risk. And he wants to say those aren't two separate things. Like it's it's a holistic thing. And again, if if what you're doing by mitigating risk is lowering your wealth, or the or the or if you're lowering the long term mm-hmm. compound annual growth rate of your wealth, then you're doing something wrong. Then you shouldn't be doing that particular mm-hmm. risk. It's not mitigating your risk if it's making you poorer. That's that's kind of what he's getting at. If because mm-hmm. the risk is you're going to end up poor, you're going to lose your wealth. And so he's so mm-hmm. on the one hand, like I say, I know some listener because again, this was me when I first read 
some of his early chapters, I I thought he was making a basic mistake and misunderstanding the nuances. But of course, no, he does know. <laughs> I think he went to the Quran school at, at NYU, and so he knows what the standard financial people are saying. The, the, you know, the economist. But but right, it's everything is is risk mitigation in one sense, and everything is growth maximization in another sense, and it's really a sort of simplistic framework or in simple models that aren't very realistic where it can make sense to like treat those as separate things. Well, you mentioned compound annual growth rate. That comes up time and time again in this book. And for him, the definition of a cost-effective risk mitigation process, which we could call a safe haven, a cost-effective one is one that, uh, I guess, owning it or employing it increases your compound annual growth rate. So that's almost the definition of of what this whole book is about. Right, e- exactly. Um, and so this, it some people might know this, it's called the, uh, um, in some contexts, the Kelly Criterion after, uh, I think the guy worked for AT&T Labs or something back in the day, or maybe it was called Bell. Um, and in terms of like, what do you, like if you have a, a, a gamble that you're, you know, 60% likely to win, how much of your, of of your uh, stake, do you do you wager on that round? And so you know, so people who know how to count cards in blackjack and things like that, like that's where they use this stuff, like to say, okay, besides knowing what's the correct move to make in this scenario, like given what my hand is and what the dealer's showing in his up card, if I'm keeping track of the deck, how much of my total stake do I wager on the next hand? You know, that sort of thing. So it's not a hundred percent because what happens if you bust, then you're dead. You know, so mm-hmm. and so, and so the Kelly criterion is the one that maximizes the you know the the compound annual or, or average growth rate over time. Um, maybe just a quick way to, real quick to get people to to see the difference. So if 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 you had um you know what one one investment like there were, let's say there were two years and one one would go up a hundred percent and then down fifty percent and then a different one, um would just return 10% and then 10%. It depends to say which one is better. It depends how you quantify it because the, if you're just doing, if you're just averaging like arithmetic average of the growth rates in the first one, it's plus a hundred and then negative 50. So that's, you know, positive 50 divided by two. So that's 25% per year. If you just do the simple, you know, you add up the total and then divide by the number of years. Whereas the other ones is obviously 10% per year. And so it looks like, oh, I would go with the first investment. But if you actually, and, and that would be true if you were just randomly going to put your money in for a year and then pull it out. And if that's what you were doing, then that first investment, you know, some people might say would be better, or at least that would maximize if you had millions of people doing that time and again, then that would be the thing that would maximize how much money you'd have in the pot when you were done. Whereas in practice, though, if you were going from start to finish, Clearly, with that first investment, you know, hundred it goes up hundred percent, so you double your money. Then it goes down fifty percent, so it gets cut in half. So you're just treading water. You would end that two year stretch exactly where you started. You know, your portfolio would be the same value, whereas the other one you would have earned ten percent to you know two years in a row. So again, that's just the simplest way I can come up with to sort of cut through a lot of the the math to show it when you say like what how do you maximize your growth or whatever it it you have to get more specific. And so what. Mark is recommending in in all of his examples and his philosophy for his readers is to say, yeah, what you want to actually maximize is that compound long run growth rate, because the the basic intuition is a big loss is devastating because you're carrying in all your accumulated earnings. If it takes a big hit, you know, that Mm. brings down the whole, you know, a percentage loss applies to all of your previous earnings. Mm-hmm. Not it's not just that you're putting out a thousand dollars at a time. If you keep letting it all roll with each successive round, then you really want to make sure you don't encounter a big loss. So that I guess that's one way of putting it. And that's why in this book, insurance comes out to be such a hero. And you know, that's kind of the whole point about these these so-called safe havens. It's it's not merely that, oh, for people who have certain risk, you know, uh preferences and are very conservative, maybe they want to consider safe haven. His point is, no, for anyone who wants to get richer in the long run, you can't have a catastrophic loss because then, you know, that just knocks you back. So you want to have tail hedging or, you know, whatever these other safe havens are. Well, a lot of the book is based in the early chapters on the work of Daniel Bernoulli, who was a Swiss mathematician and physicist and 
Uh, Spitznagel even goes so far as to call him the patron saint of universal investment. So he's an 18th century guy, brilliant guy who did, I guess, initial work in risk aversion, wrote some pretty famous papers uh, in Basel and Switzerland. So is Bernoulli somebody you studied in your PhD program, Bob? Right. So this was a good example of how, you know, Mark really opened my eyes to this stuff and challenged my paradigm, I guess you'd say. So the so yes, Bernoulli, and by the way, Bernoulli is from a whole family of very sharp, you know, mathematicians and people who con- contributed stuff. So there's different Bernoullis are known for different things. But yes, this, the Daniel Bernoulli you're talking about, he's known, and if you go and teach the history of economic thought, just a standard course, not just, you know, something that Rothbard would care about, but just in general, Bernoulli is credited as the person who came up with the idea of the way you you model risk is by having a utility, a concave utility function in terms of well. So mm-hmm. the idea, what it, was, what it was trying to solve is this thing called the St. Petersburg paradox. If I explain what he was doing, then it, it'll make more sense to people. So there is this paradox going around back in the day. And the, and the idea was there was this game. I'm going to change the details to make it easier, but you're flipping a quarter. And then if it keeps coming up heads, then the amount you win keeps doubling. All right. And so let then so maybe you're going to flip it a hundred times, let's say. And so, you know, if you, if it comes up heads just once, then you, you get a dollar. If it comes up heads twice, you get two. If it comes up three times, you get four, then eight, 16, and so forth. No, I, sorry. It, it's not a finite time. You, you just keep flipping until you get a tail. Okay. And then the payoff is according to the way I said that the number of consecutive heads you get, you get the money keeps doubling. And so then the question is, how much should a rational gambler be willing to pay to the house to play this game one time? If those are the rules that I just laid out. Mm-hmm. And if you go and do it, if you assume people just want to maximize the expectation of the payout, which is sort of like the arithmetic thing, like I did at the earlier example about, you know, oh, a plus 100 minus 50. So it's 25 percent on average per round. If you go and do that, it turns into be infinity because technically you could just have this endless string of heads. And the, yeah, the probability of that happening keeps getting cut in half. But, you know, the, the payout keeps doubling. And so it's just a series. The expected amount from each subsequent toss is one dollar, one dollar, one dollar. So the current, you know, the expectation of the of this game pays out an endless stream of one dollars. And so that's infinity. So you should be willing to pay any finite amount of money. And you think you're whereas, you know, clearly that's crazy. No one in the real world is going to pay two trillion dollars to play that game once because they know they're not going to get two trillion dollars. That's not going to happen. Right. So. That's the kind of thing that Bernoulli was trying to solve. And the way he did it was he said, oh, I mean, let's suppose that what you're not, what you're trying to maximize is not your wealth, but the utility you get from a certain amount of wealth. And if that is a concave function, like, for example, the logarithm of W instead of just W, then maximize, you know, the, taking the expected value of that thing since it, yeah, if your wealth doubles, the logarithm doesn't quite double. It goes up, but it doesn't double. So that's the idea that that makes the thing finite. And so you, you avoid the absurdities. So that was, so economists, and that's how to this day, economists, if they're going to put utility functions with, you know, math and their models and view investors that way, that's what they do. That that they assume that, oh, the, the millionth dollar to you is not worth as many utils as the tenth dollar, right? Mm-hmm. So diminishing margin utility, if you're using a cardinal conception. So that's what they attribute to him. But what Mark showed is, and, and that's the way, and I taught that, you know, in history of economics, that's just standard stuff in the in the textbooks. If you're teaching history of economic thought, that, oh, that's what Bernoulli did. And, you know, he, I, I guess it probably was French that he wrote it in. And I certainly didn't go back to the original and go translate it. And, and so what Mark did was he was challenging that and saying, no, no, that's not what Bernoulli was saying. What Mark was saying is that Bernoulli was trying to basically advance the Kelly criterion and was saying what you should do is the thing that maximizes Mm -hmm. the compound average growth rate. And so mathematically, it it just so happens with the examples he picked, Bernoulli, both are true. But the economist, Mark argued, seized on the particular functional form, you know, with the logarithm and said, ah, see, he was the first guy to say, let's model people as deriving utility from the logarith- natural logarithm of their wealth. And that's what economists ran with, whereas Mark was saying, no, that was just a particular, he just used that as an example. His actual philosophical point was that what the rational investor should do is maximize the compound a- average growth rate. And so, and, and 
in general, those two things aren't the same. And Paul Samuelson famously mocked the people who were pushing the Kelly criterion. So if for an extra bonus for Austrians, Mark ends up siding with the people that Samuelson was making fun of. So that should be extra mm-hmm. reason to like him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Mark Spitzengel points out, and as Bernoulli pointed out, there's a huge insight here, which is when we're talking about our the coin flipping game, which you mentioned, it, you know, it depends on the identity of the player. There's a subjective element to this. In other words, how wealthy is the player? Uh, a really wealthy guy might uh, give you might pay ten thousand dollars for a one time flip chance to win twenty, but a guy with only ten thousand dollars to his name would be awfully foolish and unlikely to put down that full ten on a on a one time chance to win twenty. Right, right, exactly. And so, and that was another element that I hadn't realized, like in terms of the way I used to teach Bernoulli, again, the standard history of economic thought class or something, that, that yes, when you go and actually look at translations of Bernoulli's original essay on this stuff, you're right. That That's the way he sort of backed into the math conclusion that then economists ran with. But yeah, he he said exactly what you're saying there, Jeff, that it's because, again, the, the original question was how much, you know, get, describing the mechanics of the game and the payoffs, how much should a rational investor be willing to pay? And like you say, Jeff, it it matters. It depends how much wealth you have. And I don't mean merely that, oh, someone with a $1,000 could pay up to 1000 and someone with 50 couldn't possibly pay more than 50 I don't just mean merely that, but I'm saying that even if the person who has 100 would only pay 20 somebody else who has 50 wouldn't pay 20 you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, so it's, it's mm-hmm. not just that they wouldn't be able to, it's that they shouldn't. And, and yes, yeah, so Bernoulli had that in there from the beginning. And it, and that's, that's included in the Kelly criterion too, which is, you know, that that's a, what the Kelly criterion actually tells you is how much of your, what percentage of your bankroll. I think earlier I was saying the word stake, but bankroll is the, you know, the more to common term in, in terms of gambling, what proportion of your bankroll should you be willing to wager on a given round given your advantage vis-a-vis the house and, you know, in case the deck is good for that, for that deal. And so, and it's the only reason you would bet a hundred percent is if you had a hundred percent chance of winning. And so, so that, you know, the, the Kelly criterion, it's some formula that's a function of your advantage on that, on that round, but it, it works out that, yeah, you, you would normally bet less than your full bankroll. And so that's, that's the way to think about it. And like you say, it's, it is Austrian in the sense that it's showing it's, it's subjective based on um, how much wealth people have. But what's well, what's interesting is just to throw a curveball. So Samuelson and the economists who think like him, they think it's no, it matters what your risk tolerances are. Whereas Mark sort of thinks that no, it really any enlightened rational investor really ought to be following this principle. And if you're not, then you you're you know you're not trying to maximize your. So I mean, I guess unless you were saying. If your preferences are you don't want more money, you know, so you could say that, sure. Like if you're a monk or something or you just have qualms about being too rich. But in terms of just, you know, wanting to maximize your your wealth after 50 years or something, I think Mark is pretty adamant that this is what you want to do. Whereas in general, most economists don't think that. And that's why this initially I, I had a hard time seeing where he was coming from. But then, I, like I say, I, I got it more as I was reading more of the book. So coming out of Bernoulli is one of the big blind spots for investors, I guess, both professional and individual investors, which Mark Spitznagel identifies is that we ought to be thinking more about the geometric, either costs or returns of investment plays. But instead, we turn, tend to look at the arithmetic uh, costs and returns. So that's that's something that recurs throughout this book. And that's that's what we're missing, I think, is, is part of Spitznagel's message. Right. So mathematically, yeah, the earlier example, and I'll just repeat it again for the listeners because I realize throwing numbers around, it's kind of hard to, to retain it. But you, right. So again, just imagine you got investment A in year one gives you a positive 100% return in year two, a negative 50%, whereas investment B just positive 10%, positive 10%. Which do you prefer for if you're just doing the arithmetic average and you want to maximize the arithmetic average, then it's the first one because that returns 25% per year on average. Whereas the second one's ten percent per year, but the geometric one, the second one outperforms because the first one, the you know the average 
geometric growth rate is 0%, right? Because you double and then get cut in half, so you just treaded water. So mm-hmm. that's um, – so, again, it's – if that's an exaggerated example where it's – and I pick those numbers because it's stark. That's how I kind of remind myself when I get lost in this stuff to see the difference. But, you know, that that's what's going on. And by the way, just in terms of news you can use and whatever, this is why sometimes you got to be careful when you look at like a prospectus for – some, you know, stock fund or whatever, and they give their, their, oh, over the last 15 years, our fund has returned an average return of such and such Mm -hmm. percent. Sometimes what they're doing is what I just said. They look at each year's return, they add up those numbers and then divide by the number of years. And that's the number they tell you. That is not the same thing as saying, if you put in a hundred dollars in the beginning and just let it ride, what would be your, you know, average percentage growth rate over that whole frame because again, they're they're not you know again I'm just repeating myself. So that's but so the geometric return is the one that says that's the fund. If you're using that criterion for evaluating per fund performance, that's the one that means if you put in a hundred dollars in the beginning, how much? Where do you have the most money after the whole thing's done with? That's the geometric return, and so that's why Mark is saying that's what you should care about because as an investor, you want to have the most money when all is said and done. Well, if we go back to this idea, his idea, that risk mitigation can actually be a, a source of increased investment value rather than a cost, that it increases wealth, it's, it seems like – there's a couple points where he makes some pretty pointed criticisms. This isn't just a book uh, critiquing some of the modern portfolio theory and investment approaches which are out, out there dominating today, but also it's really a critique of modern finance, Bob, how we uh, – you know, add up an account for things. Yeah, exactly. And just to sort of reiterate some of the points I fired up before, that, that yeah, what you know, guys like um, Fama and and Sharp, like if people heard of the Sharp ratio, things like that. Mm-hmm. So that coming out of that whole Chicago school tradition, yes, there is this idea, like the Cap M model, if people know that phrase. Um, th- th- yeah, there is this idea that you're going to get in a sort of ideal investment that's or portfolio that's based on the correlations of various things with the underlying uh, so-called risk-free asset, and you build it that way. And then if you, and then it has a certain expected rate of return. And if you're risk-loving, if you're more aggressive and you want bigger returns, then you'd go ahead and get leveraged. You would borrow other people's money to invest in this basic portfolio mixture to increase your expected return, but it's also riskier that if things go south, then because you're levered, you know, your return takes a hit. But on average, you think you're going to earn more. And, and then, you know, going the other way, you could you could buy insurance or, you know, hedge yourself the other way to make it so that your expected growth rate is lower, but then also you're protected in terms of volatility. So, I mean, to make it even simpler, like the difference between stocks and bonds, like, you know, they would say, oh, so somebody who's really conservative might have a lot more bonds in his portfolio than stocks, whereas, you know, a 25 year old who's not married, he just go, go put it all into a into tech stocks or something, you know, really swing for the fences. So th- that's the kind of the conventional framework. And again, that's what Mark is railing against. And he's saying that it's it's wrong to view it that way, that what you're trying to do is pick the investment portfolio that's going to maximize your long term expected growth rate, but doing it the geometric mean way, that that's the way you got to measure it. Because that's the thing that it's equivalent mathematically if you maximize the geometric mean growth rate to saying what's the thing that's going to leave me the wealthiest at the end of this period. And I realize it it, it sounds that might sound funny to people that, you know, well, isn't everybody trying to maximize wealth? But it's again, it, it in practice, it would lead you to do different things. And that's why, you know, this isn't just quibbling over words or some, you know, arcane, silly math examples. It really does have practical significance in terms of which investments would you retain. Right. And he's he's very uh, bold about this. He says, look, everyone's trying to mitigate risk, but what they won't admit, or at least based on what they actually do, is they're not trying to do it in a cost-effective way. They're doing it somewhat blindly. And you know, he's got a whole section here at the end, Bob, on what he calls bold conjectures, which he's actually looking at some of the potential safe haven type assets or investments and talking about them and judging them and weighing them. And he starts out with this little section on epistemology, which I thought was so fascinating because he says, look, you know, just the, the fact that a safe haven has been tested in the past and proven valuable doesn't tell us anything. We have to look at this continuously. And he makes a couple 
uh, really far-reaching points in this book. He brings up Nietzsche and, you know, all this sort of uh, philosophical stuff. And he says, you know, a loss today, that stays with you forever. You can't look at that uh, just as a moment in time. Oh, you know, I lost on this stock. It, you know, the company went belly up or something. It, one of his points is that this we have to look at this all temporally and continuously because that loss today reduces your investment capital and the opportunity cost of that, you know, again, compounded or geometric over time is is something that even if you're 25, that's with you in a sense when you're 85. Right, exactly. And incidentally, this is how the, the Kelly criterion came to be that Kelly himself, um, that's the last name of the guy. It, it was interesting. I mean, this guy was a, a genius, I think, because it's if you go dig up because I did this, you know, in terms of this book, trying to understand this stuff, I went and got the original paper and it, it wasn't about financial stuff at all. It was about because um, he worked for Bell Labs, like I said, and he was talking about um, like like tr transmission lines and, and minimizing the, the the signal degradation. Right. So like, you know, over the phone lines, you're trying to send information to some. So it was like information theory. And so just as an application to try to say he was saying like, oh, what if you had people at the horse race who were telling you which horse won, you know, over the telegraph lines and you were getting that information in time to go place a wager because the local people where you were didn't realize you had that that line giving you that inside information. And but there was the, a chance of degradation in the signal. And so that's how he was introducing the fact that you weren't sure which horse was going to win, but you had a pretty big advantage. And so that's and so he said, so how much would you bet? And then that's where he just like, you know, off the top of his head, just popped that thing off. But what ended up happening is he and he, and he made the remark that, oh, so if you had like a 60 percent advantage. Right. So like like with a, you know, let's say you're flipping a coin and it comes up heads. If you get six dollars and if it comes up tails, you have to pay four. That you know that kind of a thing. So you have an advantage there, and it and it turns out that if you wager all of your bankroll every single coin flip, that's the way to maximize the long term expectation of your wealth. Even even though he said, in the long run, the probability of you having zero dollars goes to one hundred percent if you just keep playing that game or something. Or, or I'm, I'm I'm mixing up the the numbers a little bit, but it's. If you, if you keep flipping it and you just get triple the money and if you come up heads, then you lose everything. I think that's what it was, something like that. And so in that kind of scenario, because you have an advantage, you want to wager everything each time if what you're trying to do is maximize the the long term or the, the expectation of the wealth. But at the same time, the wealth goes to zero with probability one in the mm -hmm. particular example he uses. So, so that... What that's forcing you to realize is, oh, yeah, the importance of how in the real world as an investor, like you say, you carry your your portfolio into the next moment with you and you got to do something with it. It's not I think maybe that's one way of putting it is Mark's point is no matter what you're doing with your wealth, it's got to be somewhere. It's got to do something. So it's kind of a Misesian point that you don't have the option of being on the sidelines, as it were, because no matter what you do that you think is safe something, you know, that is in peril somehow. Like you could be in treasuries and maybe the U.S. government defaults. You could have it in cash under the mattress and maybe someone breaks in and steals it or maybe, you know, price inflation makes it take a hit. So that no matter what you do with your wealth, it's n never somewhere that's completely safe. It's always under, you know, you're always doing risk management is what you said, Jeff. And so that mentality, that idea of that it's always getting multiplied by whatever the payout is for the next round, that really matters. And it's in a way that I didn't fully appreciate until, again, reading Kelly's paper and then reading this. So, again, I just want to <laughs> clarify, I screwed up the, the six and the four. People forget about that one. Just do it instead that if it comes up heads, it triples. And if it comes up tails, you lose everything. And under Kelly's approach, he points out that with that, if you m bet your whole bankroll every round, that maximizes the arithmetic expectation. But then the longer you play that, you're guaranteed you know, with probability one that you're going to end up with zero at some point. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that sounds like a crazy thing. And yet those, you know, so those things are different. Well, one of the safe havens he discusses, of course, is gold and gold bugs won't like this. He's not real hot on it. He's, he differentiates between tactical and strategic safe havens, the latter being preferable because tactical requires moving in and out and timing things, which he's not a fan of. So basically, Bob, what he says is that gold does really well in inflation years, 
But overall, it hasn't been a cost-effective safe haven because the you know the maybe the arithmetic annual uh, return you know or, or the the average I should say annual return looks okay. But if that's not you know if, if you're not in the right decade, let's say you're not going to do so great with gold. Right. Yeah. He so he does go through like you say in the near the end there and comes up with a bunch of. Um, popular things that are, people think of as safe haven investments, one of them being gold. And he, yeah, constructs a sort of like a, like a frontier in terms of, you know, the, the, the costliness and the, and the sort of protection that it provides. And, and yes, in his framework, gold doesn't do well. And that's, yeah, that's because as every gold bug knows, it was amazing. You were in gold in the seventies, but then when people loaded up on it and then all of a sudden they got killed in the, you know, mid mid eighties when it, when it came way down and then it kind of floundered for a while. So, um, it's, so on that one, I didn't like, yes, what he says is true, but again, that's kind of the future's wide open. And if you think that what the fed's been doing means gold's going to go way up mm-hmm. over the next 10 years or, or that the chance of it going up is higher than what the average investor thinks, then, so, so I personally still think, you know, I want to have exposure to gold going forward. But, but yes, that is, it is, it was, uh, part of his, his re- conclusion there that he actually thought gold was not the safe haven that a lot of gold bugs think it is. So one of the, one of the other hedges or safe havens he talks about, of course, is Bitcoin. I like his conception that Bitcoin is basically acts as an insurance policy against the failure of central bankers. I thought that was well put, but he doesn't seem like a huge fan. He talks about the box, the, the safety, which Bitcoin provides because you have peer to peer and nobody else can get at it. Uh, but he's less interested in the value of the thing in the box. Uh, it, so, you know, it seems like he's not a fan. He, he's got a page or two on it. I'm curious, Bob, did, he quotes you, by the way, on Bitcoin. Did, has he ever reached out to you on the topic? Yeah, um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I did review this part of the manuscript, too. Just not that he needed my input or anything, but I, I did, you know, see it and just give comments on that. So I guess my, my only quibble with his discussion there is he kind of says... Well, bit, cryptocurrency in general, and even Bitcoin, which has been you know been around the longest, we don't really have enough of a track record to really put it through the paces the way we are doing some of these other assets or these you know ostensible safe havens. But it does seem like he says, in any way, it's not that good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I kind of said, well, if we don't have enough track record, then how can you? It sounds like you're saying we don't know, but I don't like it. Mm-hmm. And you know, so it's I guess that's kind of my reaction. And he, so yeah, he does quote me. It's it's a little bit of a subtlety there. He's saying you're right that the cool thing about cryptocurrencies is the technology and the ability, the peer-to-peer ability to you know to transfer things without some centralized authority having to be trusted, but the actual things themselves are only getting value by fiat. And then he has in parentheses. In fact, Robert Murphy says that if we're going to use Mises' framework, we have to call it call cryptocurrency fiat money. Mm-hmm. So that's true. I have argued that because I'm, you know, it's clearly not commodity money to me and it's also not credit money. And then the only thing left is fiat. But I just want to clarify that it's not that I'm saying that you know Satoshi is is forcing us to accept Bitcoin and is making us value it or whatever. But by the same token, I think this is a misconception. Mises also, when he says fiat money, he doesn't mean, oh, it's money that gets its value because the government's pointing guns at people. Mm-hmm. That's not what... So it is true that the government uses coercion to get people to accept its fiat money, but the definition in the Misesian monetary framework of fiat money just means it's an arbitrary declaration by the authorities as to what counts as the money and what not. Mm-hmm. Like, the difference between legal tender, you know, a legal tender $20 bill and a green rectangular piece of paper with... A picture of Andy Jackson on it that has you know some things on it that was made by your color printer. It's not that there's any intrinsic reason that one should be money and the other isn't. It's just oh, I got to go consult the U.S. authorities to ask is this money or not. So that's kind of our so it's by fiat. So that's what he means. It's not that the reason when you go give someone a twenty dollar bill you get a certain amount of goods and services is because of the of the government's fiat. They can't force it to have purchasing power. All they can do is, you know, by their fiat, designate this is actual base money versus this other thing that doesn't mm-hmm. qualify. Mm-hmm. Well, Safe Haven, Investing for Financial Storms, that's the name of the book. If you're in the markets or interested in markets or just worried about uh, loss, 
I, you know, if you're an investor, I would absolutely recommend this book to you. It just came out from Wiley Press uh, earlier this year with a foreword by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, and also some, uh, you know, help was provided by Bob Murphy on, uh, you know, the uh, conceptual stuff in there. So that's interesting for our listeners. If you're more interested in Austrian economics and philosophy, maybe than markets themselves, but Spitznagel sounds like an interesting character to you, and I assure you he is, then I'm going to recommend the Dow of Capital, which came out back in 2013. It has a forward by Ron Paul. It is really chock full of Mises and Menger and Rothbard top to bottom. So uh, Mark Spitzdenkel is a guy you should have your eye on. Assuming you have $5 million, you can go ahead and, and uh, give it to him and he'll put it to work in universe investments. But all that said, fascinating stuff. And it's fun once in a while to talk about applied economics. I think that's uh, it's it, what he's doing here is, uh, I think, of tremendous service to people who are of Austrian mind. But also, there's going to be scoreboard. And he has skin in the game, to put it mildly. So, Bob, I'm, I'm really glad that you've been involved with Mark Spitznagel. Uh, I, I think these books are pretty fascinating. And I, so I would just want to thank everybody for tuning in and hope everybody has a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.